morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody recovered from Thanksgiving dinner yet? Are you guys still full? Yeah. I haven't been hungry for like several days now. It's kind of, you know, um, don't tell anybody, but we didn't do a turkey this year. Was, is that blasphemy? I don't know. We had ham. It was really good. Anyway, good to see you all. Um, we have a lot to get through this morning, so we're just going to jump right in. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time where we can come and hear from you and learn from your word. God, we pray that you would speak to each one of us, help us to hear what you want us to hear and to see what you want us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, if you're new with us or coming back to join us, we've been th going through this series uh, called Foundations. We've been going through the book of Genesis for, for most of the year, and well, we pretty much started in January, and we are almost at the halfway mark. So we're going to hit the halfway mark before the end of the year. So we're going to end up, we're going to be in Genesis for quite a while. But so if you have your Bibles, go ahead, turn to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, Genesis, the first book of the Bible. We're in, we're actually nearing the end of the story of a man named Abraham. The Abraham narrative, it's called. And Abraham, as we've seen, God called him when he was 75 years old. And at that time, God called Abraham, he said, follow me. And he gave Abraham what's known as the promise. The promise that God gave to Abraham was that he would make him into a great nation that he would give him land to, be, to, be, to have for his own nation, that he would bless him and his allies and he would curse his enemies. And they said through that nation, through Abraham's descendants, he was going to bless the whole world. That's the promise that God gave to Abraham. And this was given to Abraham when he was 75 years old. And at that time, Abraham had no land and he had no kids. This is a kind of an interesting promise to be given to someone who has no children at age 75. And so we've followed this, the story of Abraham throughout his life. And we've seen, it looks a lot like ours, right? We've seen a lot of faithfulness, but we've also seen a lot of failures in his life. And so we followed Abraham. And by the time he becomes a hundred, his wife, Sarah is now 90. And finally she gives birth to the child that God promised them. That was Isaac. The, the child of the promise. And we just recently read about the death of Sarah. She passed away at the age of 127 years old. So Abraham's nearing the end of his life. His son Isaac is now 40 years old, but his son is not married, right? Some of you can relate to this. You've had children who've grown up, not getting married. It's like, okay, you know, when's, when's this going to get going? Because Isaac is the child that God promised the nation will come through him. That's hard to do when you're not married, right? And so Abraham goes about trying to find a wife for Isaac. He sends off, off his servant, Eleazar. He says, go back to my hometown, you know, where we came from, find, my, find a wife for my son. And last week, Randy talked about this story, about how Eleazar traveled back to the homeland, and he was praying you know, that God would help him find the right person for Isaac. And Eleazar comes across... Rebecca. We meet Rebecca. Now, at this point in the story where we're going to pick up, Rebecca doesn't know why Eleazar is there. He knows that, that Eleazar has come from Abraham. He knows they're, she knows that they're related, but she doesn't understand or she doesn't know yet why he's there. And she just run, and she ran back to tell her family. Okay. So that's where we're picking up the story. So we're in Genesis 24. We're going to start at verse 29. Right, it says, now Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister, sister's arms and had heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you are who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I've prepared the, uh, the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels and water for him and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I've told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. So we meet this man, Laban. Laban is Rebecca's older brother. And he kind of takes a focal point here. He seems to be the head of the household, 
I'm not quite sure why. Maybe he's reached that age where it's time for him to take over. But he sees these gifts, the ring and the, the nose ring and the bracelets that Eleazar had given to Rebecca. If you remember last time, he had, he had been praying to God and Rebecca shows up and he gives her these gifts that were quite expensive. I think they were worth like $7,000. So these are costly gifts. And Laban sees these gifts and he's excited. He's excited by this wealth. And he goes out to meet this man who gave these gifts to his sister. And he says, come, I've prepared the house and we have a place for your camels. Now this is how they did, this is, this is where, how they took care of strangers in those days. There were no inns, there were no hotels, there wasn't anything like that. You know, you couldn't come into town and go to the Motel 6, right? Wait, so when visitors came to a town, they were relying on the hospitality of that town. Someone was expected to take them in, to feed them, to house them in that. So this is just, he's being hospitable and he doesn't want someone else to get out there and, and take them, claim them, right? So he runs out there and he provides straw for the camels and he washes their feet and, and provides food. And, but it's interesting, Eleazar says, no, I'm not, I don't want to eat until I've told you what I have to say. Now, imagine this because Eleazar just arrived in town that morning. Right? He's been on this trip, it took about, it was about 500 mile trip. And in those days that would have taken somewhere around a month, a month worth of travel. And he's finally gotten there. He's finally invited into, home, into a home to eat. And he says, no, I, I, I need to tell you what, why I'm here first. So continuing on verse 34, it says, so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. My master's wife Sarah has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, You must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. Then I asked my master, What if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, the Lord before whom I have walked faithfully will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you can get a wife for my son, from my own clan, and from my father's family. You will be released from my oath if when you go to my clan, they refuse to give her to you. Then you will be released from my oath. So Eleazar is there. He's telling this story, where he's come from. He says, I'm Abraham's servant. Now, Abraham, they would have known this name, Abraham. Because Abraham was Nahor's brother. So Nahor was Laban's grandfather. So he's saying, I'm coming from your grandfather's brother, right? Your grandfather's brother sent me. And he kind of tells the story of Abraham. He says, God has really blessed him. He's given him all this wealth. And he kind of lists that out. And he, and he talks about miracles. He says, his wife, Sarah, bore him a son in, in her old age. Remember, Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. That's clearly a miracle. And they would have realized, okay, that God is working here. And he says, and Abraham sent me to get a wife for my son, for his son. He says, this is why I'm here, right? I'm here to get a wife for my master's son. This was typically how wedding or how marriages were arranged back in the day. You know, now we kind of run into somebody, fall in love and get married, right? Back in these days, it was arranged marriages. So the fathers would be finding the spouse for their, for their children. And what's interesting is he says, when he was sent, Abraham said, the Lord will send his angel to make your journey a success. Now, Eleazar has been with Abraham for a very long time. He knows about the promise. He knows about the promise that God has given Abraham. He knows about the land, the descendants. He knows all that stuff. And he would have been involved in this covenant. If you remember when God gave the covenant or the, the sign of circumcision to Abraham, he said, every male in your household will be, should be circumcised. They'll be a part of this covenant. And that included Eleazar. So he's a part of this covenant. He knows about the promise. He knows about God. And he knows how important this task is. So this task, even though Abraham gave it to Eleazar, it came through Abraham, it was actually God who was commissioning Eleazar with this. 
And this is what Randy talked about last week, this difficult task of going hundreds of miles through this dangerous terrain and not knowing whether robbers are around to, to choose a wife to continue on the, the line. And Randy talked about last week, remember, when God calls us, he equips us. Eleazar was given this calling and God helped him along the way. So that's what he's explaining to them. So verse 42 It says, when I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master, Abraham, if you will, please grant success to this journey on which I have come. See, I am standing beside this spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink and I'll draw water for your camels too. Let her be the one that the Lord has chosen for my my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water, and I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And I bowed down and worshiped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. This section probably sounds very familiar, doesn't it? We just read this in the first half of this chapter. This is... Eleazar, he's, he's telling Laban and Bethuel what had just happened that morning. He's telling a story about how he came to the city. He was praying, God, please, please show me, right? Give me a sign. Let this be the sign. And Rebecca comes out and, and it's like, wow, this is just what I asked for, right? And now I'm here. And the, the implication, he's saying, so God led me to your daughter, Rebecca, is what he's saying, right? And what Eleazar is doing here is he's giving his testimony, He's giving his testimony about, this is the task that God gave me. I had a problem, and God helped me. God provided for me. And this is what a testimony is. I think many of us, well, every one of us who, if you're a follower in Christ, you have a testimony. We often don't think, I've heard people say, I don't don't have much of a story. I don't have much of a testimony. It's not really exciting. And I think that's because we're thinking of these big, dramatic changes, right? It's like we think of someone who was drug addicted or in jail or something along those lines. And we think, well, my story is not exciting like that, so I don't really have a testimony. But what a testimony is, a testimony is just testifying that God is good and God is faithful. What has he done in your life? We all have a story where God came through for us. Right? I had this problem. God helped me out with it. God is good. Or we have the story of, I used to be this way, and then God changed me, and now I'm a different way. God is good. God is faithful. You all have a story to share. You all have a testimony. And this is something that we should be talking about all the time, not just to each other, but to those outside of, outside of the family. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I think many of us have heard that verse, but what we often think of is we need to be prepared to give an answer is the part that sticks in our, our minds, I think. At least it does for me. And I think, okay, so I need to have all the answers ready in case someone asks me about, you know, why did the Jews sacrifice, you know, give sacrifices? I need to have an answer for that. Or how does God deal with, you know, infants? And if infants pass away, what happens there? What's your answer? But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse isn't saying we need to have an answer for all the what ifs and questions that we might get about God. This is saying we need to have a, an answer for the, for the hope that we have. When people ask, why do you have hope? Why haven't you given up? We need to have an answer for that. People should be looking at us and saying, why haven't you given up on your marriage yet? 
it's clearly difficult. Something's not right. Why haven't you just walked away? Or why haven't you, why, why are you being so ethical in your work? Right? They're treating you poorly. Why aren't you just kind of stealing some off the side, right? Or whatever it is. Why, aren't you, why haven't you just despaired with the state of the, that the world is in, right? We need to have an answer for that. And the answer should always be Jesus Christ. That's the answer. He's the reason we have hope. It's not because we're hoping that the right politician is going to get into office or that the right proposition is going to pass or, you know, some prophet said something. That's not the reason for our hope. The reason for our hope is Jesus Christ. And we need to not be afraid of sharing that with others. And so this is what Eleazar is doing. He's giving, he's giving them his testimony, saying, this was the problem, God helped me, God is good. And then he turns it over to them. He says, now if you will show me kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so that I will know which way to turn. He said, God has brought me here, now what are you guys going to do? Let me know so I will know if I should stay here, if I should go somewhere else. And what he's doing is he's asking for Rebecca's hand for Isaac. He's saying, will you let Rebecca return with me? So continuing on, verse 50. Laban and Bethuel answered, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca, take her and go. And let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they had said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver, jewelry, and articles of clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on my way so I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So Eleazar gives his testimony. He says, God has brought me to Rebecca. And Laban and Bethuel, this is her brother Laban and her father Bethuel, they say, they agree. They say, this, is, this seems like it's from God. So what are we going to say? This appears to be God's will. And so they say, yes, take Rebecca and go. Now notice they don't ask Rebecca if she wants to go, right? Again, this is arranged, an arranged marriage. This is how they did things in those days. The parents chose the, the spouse for their children. And so, so they're saying, yes, this seems to be God's will. So Rebecca will marry Isaac. And Eleazar, when he hears this, he bows down to the ground and he doesn't thank Laban and Bethuel. He thanks the Lord. He realizes this, the Lord has arranged this. And so he gets, gives all these gifts, these, these gold, this silver, this, these clothing. He gives some to Rebecca and then he gives some to the family. And again, this was kind of customary. This is what was called the bride price. It was a gift to the family. And so then he, he eats, he and his men eat, they stay, they stay overnight. And then the next morning, he says, let's be on our way. We've, we've spent the night, we've came what we've done to do, let's go. And Laban says, wait, 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 can't you just stay with us for 10 more days? Just 10 more days. Now we're going to see, Laban is going to come up later in the story. We're going we're to talk more about him when we get to the story of Jacob. But we see this is something that he does. He says, wait, wait, just hold, just Let's have a little delay, right? But what I've noticed, and maybe you've noticed this, is little delays tend to turn into long delays, right? I still have, I've moved into our house. We moved into our house about three years ago. I still have boxes that I haven't unpacked. It's like, I'll get to it someday, right? Just one more week. Next week, I'll do it. And, and so here, Eliezer says, no, 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 we, we got to be on our way. Let's get going. He's a man on a mission. And so they call in Rebecca and they ask her, well, let's, let's see what she has to say, which again, this is unusual because usually it's arranged marriages. The father gets to choose. And so she comes and she says, I will go. Okay, let's do this. Now for us reading this story, we go, well, of course, right? 
I mean, God has clearly laid this out. This, you know, Eleazar prayed, he answered it, God answered, and so of course she would say yes. Why can't all decisions in our lives be this clear, right? Why doesn't God speak to me this clearly? But this is our point of view reading back on the story. It seems obvious to us, the observers, it seems like an easy decision, but I don't think this was an easy decision at all. At this point, culturally speaking, Rebecca was probably between the age of 12 and 15. She's a young teenager. And think of this from her perspective, okay? One morning, she gets up, just like any other morning. She starts going about her morning chores. She goes to the well like she does every day for water. There's a guy there. He asks for a drink. And that evening, she's engaged. <laughs> right? And then the next morning, it's like, now we're going to leave your family, and you're going to go marry this guy who you've never met before. That's, that's intimidating, isn't it? So we see this, and we go, well, yeah, of course. But this young teenage girl has to make this decision. So how did she come about, how did she come to this conclusion that she would actually step into this? Well, I think there's several points here that are important for us to realize. First of all, God's will was involved, right? This was a calling from God. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever God has called me to something, it seems scary in the moment, but when you look back on your life, you realize God has been preparing you for this. You ever experienced that? You look back and you say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize it, but in this moment, in that moment, in this time, in that challenge, God was preparing me and molding me for what he's calling me to right now. So God was involved here, but also there was a lot of prayer involved. We see Eleazar praying throughout this whole thing. We know Abraham was praying about it, and Isaac was praying about it, as we'll see. There was also these circumstances, Right? It just so happened that the guy was praying by the well and Rebecca shows up and, oh my goodness, what are the odds, right? There is this circumstantial component here. Things seem to kind of come together. And there was also community. So Rebecca is making this decision, but Laban and Bethuel, they're like, yeah, this seems like this is what God wants for your life. So all of these things combined, it's God's call and his will Prayer was involved. There was a lot of worship. Eleazar keeps worshiping God here. The circumstances kind of lining up and the community approval of this. All these factored into her decision here. And this is the same for us. When we come to these decisions, we have to make a decision about what God is calling us to. It's the same thing. Is what, we're, what this decision we're about to make, does it line up with God's will? Have we been praying? Have we been, have we been talking to God? Do the circumstances seem to oddly line up? What do people, what, do our, what does our Christian community think about this? All these things work together to help us discern the will of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I've found, I've, I've noticed that especially when it comes to, to romantic relationships, people tend to Focus on one of these things, right? It's like, oh, the circumstances. I met this person, and what are the odds? And, oh, my goodness, we're in love. God must want this. And it's like, well, okay, is that person a Christian? Well, no, but, you know. It's like, what do your friends think? Oh, they hate him. But <laughs> trust me, God wants us together. You know, we, we tend to ignore these things. We pick one of these over the other. And I've seen it in You've probably seen it too, where you see someone raised up in the, in the Christian faith and then they fall in love and they, they walk away. And this is not what's going on here. It's important that, and it's important that when we come to a decision, we're looking at all these things. Does it line up with God's will? What we're, what we're thinking about doing, right? Does it line up with scripture? That's what God has given us, his clear will. We know that God wants us to be truthful. So if what you're thinking about doing does not, is deceitful, that's not God's will, right? We know that God wants us to be sexually pure. And so if the call, that, the thing that you're looking at is not line up with that, we know it's not God's will, right? What, if, what do your family think? What does your Christian family think? We need to look at all these things when we're 
looking at God's will for our lives. So God brought all these things together, his will, the prayer, the circumstances, and the community. He presents that before Rebecca, and now it's up to Rebecca to make a decision. God does this for us too. He does bring these things together, but then he leaves the decision to step into that up to us. God prepares the opportunity. He gives the call, but we have to make a decision. For those of us in Christ, those of us who are believers, we call this walking in the Spirit. We talk about walking in the Spirit a lot, yielding to the Spirit, whatever you want to call it. But this is what we are called to do. We are called to see these opportunities that God is presenting to us and then step into them. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is something that we're called to do. And it's not always easy, right? We hear we have a teenage girl going off with a, with a bunch of people she's never met to marry a man that she's never met. That's not an easy calling. And many times when God calls us to things, it's not easy either. I found that when God prompts me in the moment, it's usually something that I'm a little nervous to do. I don't know about you, but I'm, I, I tend to be, I don't tend to be very outgoing when I'm out in public. And so when God tells me to go, hey, go talk to that person that you don't know, or go pray with that person that you don't know, I'm very hesitant. I don't know about you. There was one time I'm going to, uh, going to, um, we were at a store and we were standing in line and the per people in front of me were buying a few things, you know, like milk and eggs or whatever. And I got this feeling of like pay for their groceries, you know, this was many years ago, by the way. And, um, and I was really embarrassed and nervous to like, what are, what are people going to think? And if I just say, Hey, can I pay for your groceries? You know, would that be insulting? I don't know. And so I, so I didn't do it. And they swiped their card and their card was declined and they couldn't afford it. And now I'm like, Oh boy. And, and so God was presenting me with this opportunity. And as was I going to step out in faith? Was I going to pay for their groceries? And, you know, confession time, I, I didn't do it. I was too embarrassed and they walked out without any of their groceries. And this was, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that. And I still remember that to this day because I was so ashamed of like, it was a little prompt and I didn't do it. God presented me with that opportunity. He presented me with that chance to bless someone, to be a blessing to someone, to be blessed by that. And I didn't step into it. I was too afraid. And the problem is when we have those opportunities and we don't step into it, it makes it more difficult the next time. Right? I harden my heart. I, I close my ears. I'm like, I don't think that was really God. I'm not sure, you know. But in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, it clearly was. But this is like, this is what it means to be stepping out in faith. Right? My disobedience led to a hardening of my heart. Now, again, you know, that was 15 years ago. I've grown since then. You know, I have had opportunities where I have stepped out. But the more we disobey, the more we, we refuse the calling, the harder it gets to hear the calling. And eventually, if we keep refusing it over and over and over, eventually we might not even hear it at all anymore. So that's, a, that's a warning for us. But fortunately, the contrast is true. The more we step out in faith, the more we listen to God's calling, the easier it gets to hear. Because this is what God wants to do through us, right? He wants to use us to bless the world. So this is true for Christians. This is, we are called to walk in the Spirit. But this is also true if you're not a believer. If you're not a believer, God has a calling on your life as well. He's calling you to follow him. He's calling you to salvation. John 3, 16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you are hearing this right now for the first time or maybe you've heard this a bunch of times, God is calling you right now in this moment to follow him. He's prompting you. 
He's lined up the situation. This is in God's will. He's asking you to follow him, but you have to make a choice. Are you going to respond to that calling or not? And just like it's true for us believers, we can harden our hearts. The same is true for the unbeliever. When you hear this call, if you accept it, you get new life. You're regenerated. And you step into this, this wonderful adventure, just like, like Rebecca is stepping into history in this story. God is calling you to step into his story. But if you reject that call, maybe it'll come again, but it's going to be harder to hear. Hebrews 13 warns us against this, against hardening our heart against God's call. Eventually, we can reach the point where we can't hear it anymore. And that's not what God wants for you. God wants you to accept this gift, this gift of eternal life. This is what's happening here. God is presenting Rebecca, do you want to be a part of my story? I have a wonderful, amazing plan for your life. Do you want that plan? This is a beautiful picture of God leading and mankind's obedience because Rebecca says yes. She steps into the unknown. So verse 59 says, So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebecca and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roai, for he was living in, in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. And so she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So Rebekah agrees to go, and they send her on her way with her nurse and some attendants, as we see. But they give her this blessing as she goes. And what's beautiful is this blessing, they don't realize it, but they're actually giving a similar blessing that God gave to Isaac. If you remember in Genesis 22, right after the whole sacrifice thing, where God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but then didn't go through with it, God gave this blessing to Abraham and consequently to Isaac, because this was going to go through Isaac. And this is what it said. This is in Genesis 22, verses 17 and 18. It said, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars on, in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. So God told Abraham and Isaac, you're going to have a ton of kids, a ton of descendants, and they are going to take possession of the cities of their enemies, and that's exactly what Rebecca's family said to her. May your, may your children, you know, May you have thousands upon thousands of kids. Not literally, she would die. But you know what I mean, descendants, right? <laughs> and may your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? And so they travel back. They go back with the man. Again, simple sentence, but this is a month worth of traveling, over 500 miles of distance, right? They're going through this dangerous, they could, dangerous terrain. They could come across bandits or wild animals, but they get there safely to where Isaac is. And Isaac is out in the field meditating. He's out there praying to God. He's praying and meditating on, on who God is. And Isaac and Rebekah see each other from a distance. And so Rebekah veils herself. This was, again, cultural. If you were going to meet your, your, your hu future husband, you would cover your face until they were married. And so I find it funny because I imagine this scene where Isaac sees Rebecca and he, and Isaac knows what the servant was doing, but the servant comes back and Rebecca's standing there. And I imagine the servant saying, I got to tell you this story. So first I would, and Isaac's going like, yeah, yeah, come on, come on. You know, like my wife's right there. You want to, Eliezer is going to tell this story forever, I think. And it says, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother. And this is, this is the idea that they got, they got married is what it's saying. It's this, this idea of the wedding. 
It says, and he loved her. In, in reading through this, or in my study for this, I realized, or I found that um, it doesn't often say love when it talks about marriage. It, it's, we, would, we would think love is a natural part of it, but more often than not, it's not even mentioned in Scripture. And so the fact that it's mentioned here that Isaac loved her is, is significant. There was this, um, well, there was this love between them. So that's how Isaac gets his wife, this arranged marriage. Um, the worship team could go ahead and come on up now. So this final, this final verse, verse 67, it says, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the point of the story right here. This is why the story is in the Bible. Because remember, we just talked about the death of Sarah. Sarah was Abraham's wife. It was through Sarah that God was going to provide the promised child, that God was going to have the line all the way down to Jesus Christ. And so when Sarah died, the matriarch of the family had died. And so it's this idea of, well, Who's going to take the helm, right? Who's going to be the, the matriarch, the woman of the family? And it, for a moment, it looks like God's plan is in danger. Right? This, this promise that God gave to Abraham, now it's, now it's passed on to Isaac, but Isaac's not married. There's no woman in sight. He's not going to be able to have kids without a wife. But the truth is God's plan is never in danger. Right? Then in comes this teenage girl who's, who's going to take up the helm of this family. It's unlikely, isn't it? They have this 15-year-old girl now who's going to bring about the promise of God. God's plan cannot be stopped. Our role in it may change depending on what we decide to do, but God's plan is not going to stop. God's, God has a plan for this world. He has a plan for his church. And he has a plan for your life. The question is for us, what role are we going to play in that plan? Are we going to step into God's call for our lives and step into that story? Or are we going to sit on the sidelines and just watch? God's call is rarely comfortable in fact, I can't think of a time when it's been comfortable where God calls us to something that we're like, oh, that sounds so wonderful, <laughs> so easy, right? These steps of faith are often scary. They're unknown. They can be difficult. But we know that when God calls us, he equips us. Hebrews 13, 5, God is saying, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We are not alone when we step into God's plan. And just thinking about it, it's amazing that he calls us at all. That God has a plan for the redemption of the world and he has a part for you to play. That's mind-blowing to me, isn't it? That you have a specific role to play and God wants you to be a part of it. Nothing's going to stop his plan. Nothing's going to break it. We're on the winning team, guys. He has a specific role for you. The question is, will you step into it? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that your plan is unbreakable. God, nothing can stop what you want to happen. We know how the end is going. We know that you win. And God, I pray for all of us who are a little timid when it comes to stepping out in faith, when it comes to stepping into your plan. I pray that you would give us courage. I pray that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would give us wisdom, that we would ask for help, and that we would be able to take those steps that you're calling us to. Because God, ultimately, that's where we want to be. We want to be with you. 
And God, I pray for anyone today who feels like they failed, feels like they've been sitting on the sidelines. I pray that you would, that you would reach out to them, that their hearts would be open to you, to hear that it's not too late, that you still have a plan for their, their lives. And God, I pray for those who may not have entered a relationship with you. I pray that you would soften their hearts. I pray that you would call them and that they would respond. God, thank you that you never give up on us. Thank you that you never leave us. You never forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen.